all about celebrating black men. We got a good conversation followed up with good food. Good evening. How we doing? Okay. Oh, good to see you. What's on the menu, dog? Lump crab meat, spicy mango salsa. Yeah, this is amazing. Thank y'all for coming. Got us some scrolls here. So we'll all take one, pass it around, and then we'll share our experiences, share our stories, and pass your scrolls around. <laughs> what is the stereotype of black men, and how do they make you feel? How do we feel our community views those who identify as LGBTQIA? What does a healthy, romantic relationship look like to you? And do you know how to receive love? Let me tell you something. Dating your 40. Woo. <laughs> Not looking 40, because I get, you know, I get girls in their 20s, and I'm like, yo, I'm supposed enough to be your uncle. <laughs> <laughs>
your own anti-blackness every single day. In my industry, we've, we've been brainwashed to believe that Eurocentric chefs cook the best food. When actually yeah, the Italian people, cuisine. Right, and... But actually the people that created all that was black people. I feel like we always live under this scope of performing, right? And that's heavy because you go in, no one knows you, but now they know that you are the chef. So it's now you have this thought where I got to make sure that I deliver. Correct. Oh man, this is a good one. Why is prioritizing mental health for black men becoming more important? To look at how our mental health has taken a hit over these past few years, suicide is up right now, man, like 80% when it comes to black men. And it's the third leading cause of death, ages 14 to like 26 amongst black men, black males. I attempted suicide twice, my early 20s and then when I was 30, 10 years ago. And when people ask me about suicide, I like to bring clarity because most people are not trying to take their lives because they're wanting to die. They're wanting to end the pain. Mm -hmm. I think there's been a lot of shame in our community around this idea that I, I not only need help, when I think about therapy, I go to therapy, and therapy for me has been really powerful because it's like the only person who I talk about my life with that's not in my life. I also think about like zooming all the way out and, and these questions of like, would I feel safe? Would I feel loved? Like, where do I go in the hard moments? Like, who helps me when I struggle? Like, those sort of big questions are questions that I think we've grappled with for a long time, but we've done it silently. For some reason, when you were younger, this could be different. Um, uh, for, for most people or others, but I would hold something in and I wake up the next day and it was totally gone. Well, that finally stops happening because it just builds up this wall. And then next thing you know, we could just meet and I just unlash on you. And it's just like, what the hell did I do? And Amanda, my wife, she's always like, we need to talk more, we need to talk more, we need to talk more. And I'm just like, no, I don't, like, I don't do that. But now I'm realizing the side effects, like you say, Eventually, you can't escape it, and you gotta do something about it. Who has been the most important or influential black male figure in your life, and why? So for me, it'd be my dad. Both my parents were addicted to drugs. Uh, my mother left when I was three. My father raised us. He's probably been in recovery for 30, 30-ish years. So in so many ways, I saw people struggle at their worst because my father sponsored so many people over the past 30 years, but I saw them put their lives back together. Like, I witnessed it, like, in our living room and in the dining room, and he just, like, really shaped my belief that people can, like, come from really hard moments oh. and, like, do good things. Yeah, that's powerful, man. I'm biracial. Mom's black, dad's white. There's not many African Americans in NASCAR let alone in motorsports in general. So I never really had an influential black male to look up to, because that wasn't there. My mom's dad had passed away when I was really young, and then you just grow up not having that presence. I told my mom I regret spending the last two years of her mom, my grandmother's life, with her, when it could have been my whole childhood. My grandmother loved to smoke, play cards, and sit in the house all day. I thought that was boring when I was a kid. And I lost out on all those childhood and young memories of being with that side of my family. Mine is my father. When I was growing up, he would say to me, I'm gonna be in your life every step of the way. When you have kids, I'm gonna be there. When you get old, I'm gonna beat you out, but I'm gonna be there. And then he passed that along to me. It was more than just about how big your house was. Right. It was more or less like, what do you do for the community? Who do you help? And I try to carry that with, with, my, with my family now. All right, Bob, you got the uh, next girl for us. What do we got? As a black man, how do we feel our community views those who identify as LGBTQIA+. I want to say out loud, black people are not monolithic. Yeah. Now, yeah, yeah. I, I grew up in a very affirming home. I'm not the first queer person in my family. I want to say that there are lots of black people who are incredibly affirming to queer people. You know how much it means to see someone like Jay-Z having an entire song about his mom who's a lesbian and how he loves her, and then seeing Jay-Z and Beyonce receiving awards for their allyship. Like, I don't who who else? Who else? I remember seeing videos of Prince 
making fun of Michael Jackson for being gay. Prince, who is in high heels, pumps, and a 30-inch laid wig, talking about, <laughs> I don't want to seem gay. Right. So what am I supposed to do when, when the gayest straight man in the world don't want to be seen as gay? What am I supposed to do? I think, too, um, to add to that from a clinical perspective is that people don't realize the battle of coming out. I've worked with a lot of same-sex couples and, and a lot of the uh, LGBTQ community and teens and realizing that's a daily process for them. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that I was having this conversation with the student that was coming out, he said, and the battle was, I don't want to tell my mom. And the question that I asked him, I said, how important is your freedom? And I said, if your freedom means that much to you, then you have to free yourself by living your truth. Do you know how many people are waiting until their parents die so they can have freedom? A lot of people. Exactly. Wow. I would say, um, you know, that conversation is not safe for so many people, right? Like this no, idea, like they want to be free, but you are really afraid of like getting beat up or people being homophobic. And I think now, you know, the way we start to think about the language too is like this idea of inviting in versus coming out. I don't think we have good public language for homophobia that doesn't end in physical violence. I think you gotta give us another scroll here. Full oh, surprises. Shoot. Of course I got this one. <laughs> what does a healthy romantic relationship look like to you? And do you believe you know how to receive love? I think a healthy romantic relationship uh, is based on communication uh, and really being able to listen to your partner. Do I believe on, I know how to receive love? 100% I, I believe on, I know, I know how to receive love. My mother was a big believer of making sure you say I love you before you leave the house, before you go to bed at night. I was taught that and I try to make sure I, 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 I teach that to my kids. Are we all in relationships here at this table? I'm not. No, I just started back dating. And let me tell you something, dating in your 40s, boy, woo. <laughs> and not looking 40, because I get, you know, I get girls in their 20s, and I'm like, yo, I'm old enough to be your uncle. <laughs> 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 or your brother, man. I never heard old enough to be your brother. Yeah. That's a really wide age. <laughs> yeah. That's going to be two years or three. He just, like, he just tried to find an excuse so he don't date you. Like, y'all just, yeah. I can be your brother, I can be your uncle. Yeah. I'm old enough to be your next door neighbor. <laughs> I would say, you know, one of the things that is interesting about being, I'm 37, gay, and, and dating guys is so hard at this age in some ways because as kids, like when I was younger, like we couldn't date. It was like, the things that straight people sort of got to make mistakes and learn and did that, like, then people who are my age, like, didn't get to do it so freely when we were younger, and people are sort of doing things now. And I just think about what it is like to, what it was like to grow up and everything was a secret, you know? And I think about the weight of it is, is like, more than the relationship could survive. It was, like, too much for us to touch and hold, you know what I mean? I didn't date until I was in my 30s my early 30s. I was single my entire 20s. What you said is very true about being, when you're queer, you, you're so behind on romance. Like your first, like your first kiss, mine was way later. You know what I mean? The first time you had sex, mine was way later. When you're gay, you can't walk down the hallways at school holding hands with your, with your partner at school. So when I came out of the closet, baby, I had to like burst out and be like, fuck you about it. It wasn't enough to just be like, I'm gay. It had to be like, I remember going to Spencer's, I bought a rainbow belt, <laughs> I wore it every day, whether it matched my outfit or not. I had to be an aggressive queer person. And like, you know, <laughs> when you like when you want to kiss your kiss someone on the street without looking left to right, you have to make a decision not to look around. You have to be like, I'm just gonna kiss you right now. It makes it really hard to date as an adult. I wanted to uh, wrap up the night, wrap up a, a good conversation, and with that, have a toast to celebrating black men. And hopefully, the conversations from this spark future conversations on how to be better. Cheers. Cheers.